I mentioned uh, in the morning about the importance of common sense. And I was counting the eight senses we have. And I said five are the senses of perception, also associated with the motor senses, the work people, the senses of perception. Sixth sense is intuition. And those who have the sixth sense are better off in life than those with only five senses. Seventh sense is common sense. And those who have common sense, which is otherwise very uncommon, those who have common sense are even more better off, able to cope up with the problems and the karma which we face in this life. I forgot to mention the eighth sense. The eighth sense is the sense of humor. The ability to laugh. It's a great gift given to us. The ability to laugh. Not only laughter outside, not only laughter in a loud way, but laughter inside. When you laugh inside, you see the world as a show. It's the laughter of amusement. That you're amused to look at how things are going on here. That laughter makes you spiritually and elevated. Because then you are able to take things non-seriously. We take things too seriously. They are too temporary. Too trivial to be taken that seriously. Most of the situations we face are worth laughing. For example, I see two friends, good friends, arguing over what is written, written in a book. One man says, that's what the book says. Other says, no, it's not, it doesn't say that. Book is not there. They're both arguing. Nobody knows who's right. And they'll fight over it. They'll get angry over it. Sometimes come to blows over it. And nobody is going to see the book, what is written there. What kind of fight is that? And supposing one is right and one is wrong, what does it matter what is in the book? We fight so much. We raise temper so much over trivialities. Smile as small as possible things. And in domestic life, a man goes out to work or a woman goes out to work. There's a problem there in the business, in the office, at the place of work. And they can't get their anger out. They come home, get all the anger out on the spouse, on the children. And they are wondering why they are so angry. They are angry over something else. So we spend our life in such a strange way that the experience of anger and these little small things makes life miserable. Whereas it could be very happy by just ignoring them and laughing at it. That is why in my early days I learned a two-word mantra that changes one's life. If you can remember the two-word mantra, it is, so what? <laughs> Anything happens, so what? And you'll be happy. And you'll be able to laugh at the situation. So that's why the eighth sense of sense of humor is very important. And I must tell you, I see this in the great masters. I see in perfect living masters, great sense of humor. He had a great sense of humor. And his laughter was infective. Everybody would laugh when he would laugh at a small small trivial joke or something anybody would tell. And people told stories and he laughed. So it was a wonderful experience. So also I heard laughter is the best medicine. Laughter is good for your health. Laughter is good for your soul. Laughter is good for your mind. So what a com good combination. Here is one medicine, good for everything. People don't use it because otherwise doctors will go out of business. You see. <laughs> so I have some MDs around me. I have to be careful what I say. <laughs> But the point I was making in these two days is let's realize what life is all about. Here we are, a soul, part of the Creator. The Creator is expressing Himself. I'd say Himself, but take it, it could be Himself, Herself, it less, itself, it doesn't matter. The Creator is expressing Himself as a soul. Creator is not separating himself from the soul. The Creator is expressing himself as a soul. A soul is a point of view of the Creator, not separate from the Creator. A soul is a way to have experience of seeing something from a different point of view. 
and that soul, so created, residing continuously within the Creator, never separating, undergoes experiences by shutting off the awareness of the Creator, creating its own awareness as a unit of consciousness, and given the full freedom to create whatever consciousness can create, which means unlimited infinite. In that situation, the soul creates the experience of the many. One soul now says, we are many. Where are the many? Within the one. Because nobody is left anywhere. They are all part of the one. One soul creating an experience of the many. Whose experience is it of the one? The experience of the many is not of many. One is experiencing many. Many are the creation of the one. If you understand this concept, that you can be conscious of many while you are still one. Easiest way to explain is, if you go to sleep and have a dream, in the dream you see 100 people. They are 100 people. They are all separate. They are different. They talk differently, think differently, and are replicas of the many here. And we say there are many people in that dream. Then you wake up. Were they all dreaming or one was dreaming? Only one was dreaming. They were the creations of one dreamer. One dreamer created the many. And while he shut off the experience of the creator, the many became real. The same situation happened in our true home. Where we belong, where there's immortality, where nothing, no karma exists, no mind exists, no thinking exists. Only we exist as one. That one total totality of consciousness, the creative power, emerges as one soul, the primordial soul. And the primordial soul experiences the many. And the primordial soul undertakes an experience outside of itself in time and space by attaching itself to a mind. It creates a mind for experience. The mind immediately creates time and space and puts events which occur simultaneously in no time, puts them over a timeline and a space line and puts them events. They'll take place here and there, now and then. And all those events are placed at once. Infinite number of events. And the one creates the many, divides those events to the many and puts that power of experiencing those as if they belong to all of them like we do in a dream. We argue with a person in a dream. We have separated ourselves from the person we are arguing. When we wake up, there was no person we were arguing with. We created that person and the argument. The one creates the reality of the many and thereby shares that consciousness as if with the many. And the many then keep on going on with their mind, which is also one. They divide, participate in one mind. One consciousness, one mind, shared by so many, created by that power of consciousness. Then the game goes on. It's a wonderful experience in time and space. And the soul using the mind, looks over all the events created, looks back into the past. It's an infinite past. One can look as far as one can go. How far is infinity? Infinity is also not infinite. It's finite. You know what defines the finiteness of infinity? What is defined is how far can you go? If you want to go more, you can go more. But since in time you can't go forever, therefore how far you go is infinite. You can go more, it will be infinite. But because the power that we have invested in ourselves is bound by time and space at that level, so the infinity becomes finite. And we can go as far, keep on expanding our memory, expanding our space, expanding time and space, and looking at more events that are all created there. Then we go further. To experience those, we divide the experience of those events into several forms. Those experiences we can pick up straight away. 
grasp with our mind. But we divide it further. For variety. For greater experience. And we divide them into different perceptions. Seeing becomes separate from hearing. Before that we could hear a vision and we could see music. There was no distinction between any of the senses. They all work together. The sense perceptions divide our experience. And we are very happy. That's great. We still have the opportunity to look. Hold. This is a great experience. Hold it and we can look at it. With the mind, we could look at all the events. We could go back and forth on time. But when we put on the sense perceptions on ourselves to have greater variety of experience and divided them into separate perceptions, we also did not allow this to become just a series of events placed one time. We allowed time to flow. And we began to see as if events are coming and going, coming and going, and they are all coming and going. But we could stop it and event wherever we liked to see it. It was still within our power. In order to advance further into a different kind of reality, we created a human body and placed this whole complex of our own totality, of our own individuation, as a soul, our own use of a mind, our own use of sense perceptions, this whole package got fitted into a human body. And we all are one, created by the many, and we are still one. Who is that one? Amongst us, who is that one? That's a difficult question, because we look at so many, but then we look at so many in the dream also. Other people say in the dream, I am also seeing you, so I am also as real as you. When do we find out that that one was real, the others were created by the dream, when that one who is dreaming wakes up. When he wakes up, he finds he created all the others. We are in the same state. Each one of us believes that we are equally real. But when you wake up, you'll find out who was real. And you'll find only one was real. All of us were part of that one. The first wakefulness will show you that. Which means keep on getting unaware of these covers that you got on yourself. And you reach the top, you'll find you're only one. It was one all the time. Not at one time. Not that the creator was one and we are many. We created the experience of the many. Still being within the one. We never left the one. We never loved our totality. And therefore, this is a secret of creation. Very few people have expressed it. Very few people know about it. Very few people know how to reverse this process and go back to the one and hold all this experience together and jump from one experience to other when you like. Imagine what an interesting journey it would be. A journey from one level of consciousness to another. So that's why these are the kind of journeys which are truly opened up to us when we go to a perfect living master. Not a small thing, just getting enlightened. What is getting enlightened? A person who wakes up gets enlightened. A person who wakes up one step more gets more enlightened. A person who knows in a dream, I'm a dreamer, this is a dream, is enlightened. He's telling other people in the dream, I know it's a dream, he's enlightened. Not actually enlightened. Because if he was really enlightened, he would not tell anybody. He doesn't go back into a dream. Sometimes we want to go back to dream. I once wanted to go back to dream, I'll tell you this. In a dream, I won a lottery. <laughs> and I won five million dollars. They said, check or cash? I said, cash. So I brought a huge heap of cash. As I was going to pick it up, I woke up. I said, let's go back to sleep. <laughs> oh boy, I lost my lottery just by waking up. This is a, what I am telling you is a key to why we are here. A key to why we still like to be here. Because we think the lottery is here. We look around in this world and look at everything around here. We say, this is why we have a lottery here. So we don't want to wake up. And the mind is clever enough to be attached to the $5 million 
or to a person or to an object or to a house or to a car and wants to stay here. So the attachments that keep us here are built into the system that we get attached, we don't want to leave it. It's amazing when you look at all the species of life forms, animals, insects, none of them wants to die. It's, it's instinctive. The instinct built into us is to survive. To survive in life. Hold on to what you have. We don't know what will happen after that. Hold on to what you have. Even if it's a worse situation, we don't want to die. Little insects moving in dirt. You try to pull them out, they'll go back into the dirt. They think they're threatened. Life is threatened. When life is threatened, you want to fight it. Why? This is the instinct built into us to survive where we are and not leave it. These are very beautiful entitlements created by this very prison of physical life. So we get stuck so much so hard into these things, we don't want to leave. And that's why it becomes hard to turn the mind around to say, let's go and find something else. The mind accepts the physical reality as one only reality because we are awake in this reality. If we were awake in another reality, mind would still think that's the only reality. It won't say, now I found out too. When we go to sleep and in the dream, we say that's the only reality. When we wake up, we don't say that was also reality. We say that was a dream. This is real. The mind has trained itself to accept one reality because if it doesn't, it won't be reality anymore. If the mind begins to think that there is more than one level of reality and you can wake up from reality to reality, it will no longer be real. That means it's just an illusion created. You go from one illusion to another. The book says it's illusion. But the mind says, no, it's real. The book says, this is unreal. The mind says, pinch yourself. Or let somebody hit you on the head and tell me it's real or not. Shakespeare says, there never yet was philosopher who could bear the toothache patiently. He could talk philosophy. He could talk everything unreal. When he sat in the, in the toothache, he said, no, no, this is real. Pain makes it real. That guy who wrote a book and gave a talk on the power of now, in that book he writes the whole chapter, in fact, there are more than one chapter, on the importance of pain. And he claims that pain makes us real. Pain is what makes this world real. If we had no pain, we'd be flying. Maybe this is an angelic place. Some we don't know. It's not real or real. People have a good time. They say, yeah, we think this looks like unreal. Surreal. Unreal. But when the pain comes, that's real. So we are affected by this. So when pain is an essential part of this physical reality. And therefore, we have pain. It can be physical pain, emotional pain, or both, or mental pain, even spiritual pain. Pain is there. And that makes the situation real, makes us real in this situation, makes our body real. And this is reality. This whole system in which one experience of a level of consciousness it becomes a reality is designed for very good purpose, to have the best experience. You can't compare a real experience with experience on the shadows. We go and see movies. We stay put in our chairs. Murders take place there. All kinds of things happen. If they happen here, we don't rush and try to do something. We don't do anything. We don't just a movie. It's on the screen. It's a shadow. And this is actually just the same shadow. But we take it as real. It's designed differently. It has pain. Movie doesn't give us pain. Sometimes we cry. Sometimes the movies, I don't know, they make people cry. They do make me cry. I don't think, I don't, can't remember a single event in my life when I cried. Except when I'm in the movie. My kids know it. And my kids carry extra handkerchief for me. They sit next to me, the movie comes, they give the handkerchief, no stop crying. I, I can't distinguish. I think there's more reason for crying seeing what's happening in an imaginary story than what's happening here. Because truthfully, this looks like more of a movie than that. 
and when you are able to see all levels you will find all our movies all of them are movies including this life there is no difference they are projected the same way i sometimes compare going to a theater to watch a movie and comparing it with what we are watching in a multi dimensional world of life here we go to a movie we sit on a chair and look at a screen in front action is taking place there some horrible thing is going to happen i see notice people sitting on the edge faces are all frightened a man made a very nice movie he showed a horror movie and put the cameras on the screen and made a movie of the people watching that and he saw how really frightened the people got they forgot it was just a movie we forget it's a movie we laugh with them we cry with them and we identify with that movie how do we forget for a moment just a shadow it's just a shadow on the screen and nobody cares to see how the shadow is being created nobody looks behind so the light that is causing the shadow is coming from behind is not in front at all it is a projector behind and the projector behind has a film in it the film has nothing moving in it they are all still pictures still pictures moving rapidly with a light source behind it the light source is going through those rapidly moving still pictures and make us so frightened make us so scared make us laugh how can that happen because we don't look back we're looking only at the movie you go behind the eyes look at the projector look at the light the projector is your mind it has got still pictures is a created movement of the still pictures that's creating this life and behind that is your soul yourself the light that is going through the mind and creating it you put the light off the whole show finishes like in a movie if the light puts off whole show finishes if the light of our soul finishes everything finishes the light of the soul piercing through the projector of the mind laden with the film of our karma of our pralab is creating this show here am i making good story no i am wanting you to check it out i am not even saying that believe me i am saying check out is it this is how it is happening how can you check out turn your head around if i said the same thing in a movie hall that look you think it's real no turn around and see the projector you will understand everything you go back and see how the movie put into the camera or to the projector and you are seeing it same thing you can do here since it's coming out from inside just close your eyes turn around and see what is happening the very thing i'm saying is verifiable is not verifiable by any outside empirical evidence it's verifiable by personal experience you can just personally go and see how is this created supposing one day you suddenly see people freezing that means they don't move then they start moving they don't move this life will become a movie from that moment for you supposing one day you look in the mirror and you see your face there and you raise your hand but the mirror doesn't raise its hand it will become a movie there so we so many things are happening to create the reality here and one little upset which can happen it has happened with people people who didn't believe these things had these experiences and that caused them to believe this is not real we saw pieces one person went to little meditation but frightened because wasn't expert in meditation but not doing it for a long time suddenly saw that the world being created was being built from little pieces they had been thrown up and, and people were becoming real with those little pieces and they began to talk that they are so unreal the shock was i was so attached to these people they are just being made up they are just being made up for the sake of my experience so this whole world is made the same way but why am i saying this why should you do this just so that you are not attached to shadows not attached to that which is not real with the real thing is within you what is the real thing 
you want to have reality you want to fight reality go with it you are real the one that is seeing all this is real always no matter whether you are seeing a dream or you are seeing a physical world astral world causal world spiritual world totality you are the one who are real the self is always real and unchanging what it observes and experiences is always changing and unreal if the definition of reality was that which never changes then the only thing that never changes is the observer everything else changes in this physical world nothing stays the same at all every day things change planets change galaxies galaxies change our daily event our change we change our body state everything changes and the one that is real never changes keeps on watching the change so that is why those interested in finding what is truly real they can find it within themselves because their own self is real and once they have a discovery of their own self they know reality but in order to enhance the experience that we generate from the illusion we want to make everything outside real and we done a good job i must say we done a very good job every time we project it's real and this one at this time looks the most real because at one time we can only have one level of experience of reality currently our physical life is real people sit in meditation to have an experience of higher levels of consciousness another little secret i'm going to tell you it's a secret because even masters won't share that with you because the secret it's a secret only found in masters handbook of handbook of manual the secret is that when we say we have gone to such khand we got to this level we have never left our body <laughs> that's the secret because they all say vacate your body vacate this body go to the higher body vacate that body go there we never vacate this body and how do we have those experiences of vacating the body it's a game we play with the tension this human body and great master hinted about it when he talked the swami about 18 chakras just like it has the energy centers where you can concentrate your attention and get other experiences including out of body experience this capacity to withdraw attention only makes you unaware of this body you are still in the body body is not dead your vital functions are going on there your heart is beating your breathing is going on everything is going on normal what is happening is you have become unaware of the body you haven't died the body is alive but you have hit upon those centers inside and those are the 18 centers we talk about six of the energy and then six of creating the astral and the cosmic planes and six that create other planes of absolute immortality and infinite no time and space those are the 18 centers and those centers are built into the, the little little points built into the body into the head when the attention gets concentrated and moves in words it touches those points and opens up that experience so the experiences we have are real in the sense that when you die or if you die in all the bodies you will go there but you are able to have a preview of all that right now it is not shared by too many people that we don't really die if we really died everything will end the show will end here it will be dangerous if you want to meditate and end the world there's no no good meditation you should be able to get up and say no no i had a good experience i went to such khand i'm back i made a journey and that these statements are only possible because we are continuously in the physical body but we are able in this physical body to have the experiences of unawareness of the covers and awareness of the inner self and which would happen if these bodies were completely destroyed and the experiences outside were completely destroyed you would still have the same experience but you can have them while you are living that's why this is dying while living it's not dying while dead dying while dead means end of the story this is dying while living you are living in the same body and having all these experiences so it's remarkable the more experience you have in meditation the more you will be able to identify exactly where these points are and the points are almost a replica 
of the points of energy, the similar points exist backwards and six points, six points above. And these points that are lying inside the head, that's where attention moves slowly. When we say sit in third eye center, we are gathering our attention from the physical body. We are trying to pull our attention from the hand and the feet up to the head. And when the attention is fully drawn there, we become unaware of the body. We open up the other experience. We meditate in the other experience, in the other body. We meditate in the other body. We pull ourselves out of the extremities of that body. Same identical procedure. And we pull ourselves into the center. And where is the center? Where we are at all times. We are always in the center. If I speak too much truth, I think they lock me up in a nut house. <laughs> I'll tell you an example of how I could be declared mad straight away by telling the truth. Now, truth is, you want to go drive in the car. You're driving from here to New York. And you're saying, long distance, my car is moving. And I come and say, you never moved. You never left, you never moved, you are stationary. But I can feel I am moving, my car is moving, I am driving. No, you are at the same place, the world around you is moving backwards and the car is also giving experience of movement and you are feeling you are moving. You haven't moved ever. The whole creation around you has moved around you. When we go on a the train, there's the platform, and train is moving slowly. We think the platform is moving. You see it sometimes. Or there are two trains together, one is stationary, other moves, we think oh, we are moving. Or it's common. Movement is considered relative to what else is moving. Supposing the entire environment, entire creation around you is moving around you, and you never moved. And I said this, this is the reality. They locked me up. But this is the reality. <laughs> the reality is we never move. Then where are we? We are, we are not moving. The very place I am pledging to uh, encouraging you to go back to our true home. I am going on saying let's go to our true home. That's where we are. We never left it. Only the experience around us left it. The experience was generated to make us feel that we have left it. And it's the experience, generation of experience through consciousness that's creating all this change, movement, etc. These are truths that anyone can experience. Very difficult to explain. Very difficult to explain that things are happening totally in a different direction than we take it. We think the world has been projected, we are looking at it. Nobody says we are looking at it, therefore we are projecting it. They've called this issue into question. Is the tree there before, because you look at it? Or the tree there because actually there you are able to see it? Which one is true? People they debated on this. For thousands of years they debated on this. If the tree falls and nobody there, does it really make a noise? Or somebody hears, does it make a noise? A great scientist like Einstein toward the end of his life observes, I did not realize the importance of the phenomenon I am describing and the role of the observer in it. Here the last notes. Because by that time, the quantum theory had come in. In the quantum theory, things were happening which were totally inconsistent with all our knowledge. In the quantum theory, they found out that in a unit of matter, the smallest unit, the smallest piece of matter known to us is hydrogen, hydrogen gas. It has a very small nucleus and one electron moving around it. Nobody knows in which orbit it moves. We know how far it is from the center, from the nucleus. We know this far. Is it moving like this? Is it moving like this? There are billion positions that you can place it where it may be moving. We didn't have the means to know where it's moving. Today we have a laser technology that can go to the level of an electron. An electron microscope using laser technology can go and pinpoint exactly at the distance. It can place it here, 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 anywhere 
at the distance is appropriate. The moment you put it there, it is there. If you put somewhere else, it will be there. But once it is there, it will never be anywhere else. How could you interfere with the position of an electron? This is observed physics of today. The observed physics of today says that you interfere by observation with what is existing. One scientist has just said that the entire experience that we are having is based upon our perception. Something the mystics have been saying for thousands of years. Physics is coming to that. Astronomy is coming to that. They are understanding the nature of space and time in a way they never understood before. So when we look at it, one, one astronomer has examined space and time and he has said, we are not real. Tounding for a physics, for a professor to say that. We are not real, we are a hologram. We are a hologram because if we condense this whole planet, Earth, just take one piece out of it, space. Space is what creates the distance between particles, orbital electrons and the nucleus. If we take space out, we will collapse to the size of a pin, the whole planet. When I was in college studying physics for my graduate degree in India, a professor told me, physics professor, you know this is all space. If you take the space out, this planet will become like a football. That was in the 40s. In the 60s, I was at Harvard University in this country. There I went to a, professor, a physics lecture and they said, if the space is taken out, it will become like a marble. Today, the scientists are saying it will be a pinhead. Another scientist is saying it will disappear. Then who are we? <laughs> are we space? Or are we spaced out? <laughs> Therefore, a physics professor says, we are a hologram just bloated out by space. And yet in the midst of this hologram, just a diagram, we are able to think, talk, and find reality by meditation. How can that be? That means this is illusion. Whether you see it from mystical point of view, from metaphysical point of view, or physical point of view. This is a great advance in science and mysticism or spirituality coming together. Because they are talking very similar language now. Which they didn't do before. So the empirical Newtonian Physics was totally different from Einsteinian physics and it's totally different from today's physics. Because Einstein went wrong by that the velocity of light is a constant. Of course, he said by observation and by equations which you could write on a, on a blackboard that the velocity of light never changes. 186,000 miles per second. Whether it's going Away from us, coming towards us, it will be the same. Which led to very remarkable and ununderstandable concepts like, supposing there are two cars going. I'm a little departing from normal example, but I hope you don't mind. Supposing two cars are going, one at the velocity speed of 40 miles an hour, another passes it at 60 miles an hour. The one passing at 60 miles an hour won't feel it's passing at 60 miles an hour will feel 20 miles an hour because the other car is also going at 40 miles. You will feel the differential between the two velocities. When they measured two beams of light going, they were both going at 186,000 miles. When they measured the differential between the two beams, it was still 186,000 miles. How could that be? But it's true. It is true. Every experiment he would do, he would find this constant. Other experiment he did was because they couldn't make out what is light. Light became a big subject of study, both in metaphysics and in physics. What is light? It's just a stream of photons going out. Is it a wave going out? What is it? Because early on, they did the two-slit experiment you must have heard of. The two-slit experiment through which they sent beams of light. When the beam of light went, it created a series of lines. If it was particles, it created only two lines, two beams, two splits. When they interfered, it became wavelength. When they put it again, observed it, through putting a meter on, on the middle of the splits, it became particle again. 
they couldn't understand. Is light being affected by of looking at it? Today they believe yes, it is. The human observation is changing the nature of light. They could neither call it a particle nor call it a wave, and they kept on debating. One wise guy came and said, "I'll give you a new name for it," and he gave it the name of quanta. It's neither particle nor wave. It's a quanta, and a quanta is that which can behave like a particle or a wave, depending on it thought its own mood. Now they say on the mood of the observer. How did this change take place? By the way, the latest picture taken of a quanta has just appeared. I got a copy on my iPhone. The quanta has been pictured now. Where it's both a wave, a particle spread out with waves in it. So first picture ever taken of a quanta. The quanta behaves according to how you observe it. That means that the quantum physics, quantum mechanics, quantum theory came from that experiment. That your observation changes it. In the two slit experiment, they put a gauge to see whether the light has moved to one or the other. They tried with two two pinholes. You put the light if it's a particle going through a pinhole, it will make a dot of light on the screen. But no, it doesn't. It makes a wave. They spread out. It's not one particle. You put a measuring instrument only. Your observation through an instrument, not with the eyes. Put the instrument, it becomes a particle. <laughs> what is it going on? This is science. I'm very fascinated to see that they're coming so close to what we have been talking about for thousands of years. That they are realizing that what we thought is real is not real. It's being made up somehow, and being made up not of anything solid. Here we talk. I'm sitting on a solid chair. Physics says no, it's not solid. It's completely hollow. If you take the space out, I'll fall out. I mean, the I'll also become zero. So this is. A strange thing happening today, which shows that our awareness, by empirical study from outside, is getting us insights into what we have known already by meditational practices inside. Now, look at the a person who is observing what is outside and observing what is inside, knows the whole game, and that is possible. I am saying to those people who are curious. I was very curious to know. I'm telling people who are curious examine this. Not only study inside, study outside and inside. One of the very beautiful features you'll find by their study is that the outside is also inside. Another crazy, crazy remark: whatever is outside is not a copy of what is inside, which I have been saying, but is actually inside being projected outside. That nothing is really outside; it's like a projector. That everything we see outside is already inside, and that's why we see it outside. We experience it outside. Now you might say these are speculations, philosophy, theory. They are not. This is open to examination by anybody. We are all equipped for this. Don't think that there is somebody. A scientist has to do it. Any human being can do it. Any human being with just simple curiosity to find out what's going on, what's the truth, what's the reality, can do this. Meditation is merely a technique to verify these truths. Meditation by itself is not spirituality. Meditation is a technique; it's a method. Meditation is a method to verify these things. Spirituality is when you can go beyond all these tests, beyond all this system, beyond all matter, beyond all mind, beyond all thinking, into your spiritual self. That's spirituality. The rest is fulfilling curiosity and taking steps towards becoming spiritual. If you take these steps and can rise above the mind, you become spiritual. It is not necessary for all of us to go through all these steps. Some people think that we have to start from the beginning and we have to go. That is because we don't remember our past lives. If you could remember your past lives, you would know how much homework you have done at that time and the one life before that. It's not a one life thing. Spirituality to get you to be your seeker 
It requires a preparation which has taken place much earlier. And when you become a seeker, you've already done homework. And you left at a point when you died in the physical body. You get another chance. And you picked up from there. You, of course, grew up to catch up with it. But you catch up because from childhood, some things start happening. I've seen families where the whole family is non-believers. Suddenly a child comes up, <coughs> wants to be a vegetarian, wants to meditate, wants to be different. As a child, where does that come from? The environment is totally different. Work has been done in the past. And that shows up now. So that's why this is a verifiable science. I want you to practice it and verify what I'm saying. If you say, I am having a good life, I'm not stopping you from that. If you say, I'm enjoying my life, go ahead. Congratulations. If you are saying, no, I have a feeling in me, I have done. I am done. I am done with this life here. I want to go to my true home. Then I'm giving you a hint where to go within yourself. I'll end today's session here and I'll see you tomorrow. I'll give the rest of my time to interviews for people who are waiting and at 11 o'clock tomorrow we'll meet again. Meantime, you get an opportunity of an overnight practice of what I'm saying. So if you can practice overnight, I may have some more questions tomorrow. Thank you very much.